Your soul has an appetite. Fill it with the wrong thing and it will be eternally corroded. Uh, Fill it with the right thing and it will be eternally contented. There was a man, it was about four o'clock in the afternoon and he was a little bit hungry. It's kind of early for dinner, but he was hungry anyway. He had $25 in his pocket. And so he goes to his favorite fast food restaurant. Uh, He goes in, he sees the the options and he orders his favorite meal. He supersizes it. He gets the large Coke. He goes to his table. He eats it. It's really filling and he has to kind of loosen one of his notches on his belt. Uh, But just because you can, he goes and he gets the extra free refill at the you know, at the fountain pop thing. And then he goes up for a, a vanilla cone. He's already kind of full, but he goes up for the cone anyway. Anyway, he gets out there, and then, you know, he still has a couple dollars, you know, loose in his pocket, and so he sees uh, uh, one of those hot dog vendors, and he's like, oh, well, I, I don't see one of those kind of green health safety passes, but I'm going to go over because I have a hankering for some street meat anyway. And so he goes over, and he gets this hot dog, and he, and he eats it. And as soon as he finishes, he's walking across the parking lot, and he's, he's going back to his Honda, and he's, he's a good friend, a buddy of his from high school that he hasn't seen in a long time because his friend, they used to play rugby together. But his friend moved out to Nova Scotia and he comes back like, oh, this is so great to see you. This is so wonderful. I want you to come back because I'm visiting for the weekend and my mom has created this amazing meal. He says, okay, let's do it. So he goes back and he goes and sees, sees the table. The spread. And this is amazing. Like there's steak. Uh, there's like a big bowl of mashed potatoes and it was made just like his grandmother used to make with kind of the cheese mixed in. And there's all these sides, and there's like juices and teas and candlelight and wine. And on the side, there's this bureau with about 10 different kinds of desserts. Let's sit down. But he realizes he can't because he's so full already. Not only can he not sit down, but he can't even sit in this next room and listen to the nice conversation because at this point, his stomach is starting to rumble, and he needs to go to the guest room to lie down. Your soul has an appetite. Fill it with the wrong thing and it will be eternally corroded. Fill it with the right thing and it will be eternally contented. Let's feast on this idea. And we're going to do so by looking, uh, opening our Bibles and turning to John 6. So we have been journeying through uh, the gospel according to John. We're going through story by story, line by line. And today we're going to pick it up at chapter 6, verse 25. I'm reading from the ESV. Now, as I've been saying, just to provide the context for those who may not have been here the last week or two, um, chapter 6 is all part of one longer narrative, and so it goes way back to the feeding of the 5,000 men and their families, and Jesus did so with the five barley loaves and the two fish. And so I said at that time that this is thematically connected to what Jesus would say later about him being the bread of life, right? It's part of the context that sets that up, and we're going to get to that verse uh, today. And so that's part of the context. Since then, he's done that. He's, he's walked on water. Uh, now they're, they've gone to the north shore of the Sea of Galilee to a, a little village called Capernaum. And he's not out in the open air preaching now. He's actually uh, with his fellow Jews in the synagogue. And we know that because it tells us uh, that much later in verse 59. So uh, beginning at verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? So remember, they're in the synagogue, and this is a Uh, a form of respect. It means my teacher, my master. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves, right? And so he's kind of like calling out their intentions here. Uh, You know, how nice would it have been if they came to him uh, looking for full hearts, but they had full bellies and he knew it, right? Verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Recall that Son of Man is one of the most frequent titles Jesus uses for Himself. For on Him, meaning on the Son of Man, God the Father has set His seal. And so this is part of Jesus' way of saying uh, the things that He's about to say and that He is saying aren't just random things that He's making up on His own. He's not speaking on His own. He is sent from His heavenly Father. God has set His seal of approval on Him. He is the authorized agent from God above. Verse 28, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent, meaning himself. You believe. Now, I think we just need to pause here because believing is an action. 
Believing is a work of God. Now, the reason we need to kind of just pause on that for a second is because we live in a time when we think, oh, beliefs are in our head, they're mental, intellectual things, and they're different from actions. And I get where that comes from, and a part of that is true. However, in Scripture, genuine beliefs always have hands and feet. Genuine beliefs have hands and feet, meaning that if we actually genuinely, deeply, sincerely believe certain things, that will necessarily impact who we are and how we live our lives, but how we conduct ourselves. Um, this is called fruit. Um, you know, faith without works is dead, as James says. Um, we also think of, of Jesus talking about how, um, you know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So there's this unity. If we actually genuinely believe things, we will live different lives as a result of it. I recall at one point hearing about religious attitudes and uh, people's personal and, and, you know, religious convictions, and it was like, different categories that people could put themselves into, you know, publicly religious, publicly committed versus like privately religious. No such thing. No such thing. If we have genuine beliefs, they will make a difference in how uh, we live. All right, let's continue. Verse 30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform, right? So they want him to back this up. But the irony here is that, you know, some of these people surely have just come from the other side of the Sea of Galilee where he fed 5,000 people and their families, which was a sign. But they want sign. They want proof, right? They want more and more and more. Verse 31, they continue, our fathers, meaning our ancestors, our spiritual fathers, ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now recall, right, when God fed the Hebrews, remember, wandering through, through the wilderness, and this is a story back in Exodus uh, 16, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And so this sets up Jesus' statement, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And so this is like the thesis statement of this entire uh, uh, chapter 6. Now, a couple of things. As I mentioned last week, uh, when Jesus says, I am, it's a specific Greek construction, ego, eimi. And we might not think very much of that, but the same Greek construction is used time and time again when Jesus says a bunch of these I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the gate for the sheep. All these things, they all have the same Greek construction. And the significance is that when God reveals his name to Moses, back in Exodus 3.14, it's this same Greek construction, ego, a, me. And, so, and people knew that. So Jesus is consciously taking the name of God, applying it to himself. So this is another one of those indications of Jesus revealing his divinity to us. I am the bread of life, meaning if bread sustains us, it nourishes us, that's who Jesus is and what he does to us as God come to us in human form. That's what's going on here. There's a lot happening. Where am I? Verse 36. But I said to you that you may have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And I just love that line. Uh, it's one that I reiterate at the start of communion. Uh, Jesus is the way. He is the one who provides us with peace with God, uh, but his arms are wide open. Anyone wants to come to him, you know, no matter what their mistakes, their past, you know, how many times they've messed up, whatever station they're at in life, his arms are wide open in an act of grace. It's so beautiful. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This raise him up talk, this is most likely an indication of the general resurrection uh, at the end of time. So the Jews grumbled, remember Jews and Jesus and the disciples are Jews, they're in the synagogue, grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. And we're supposed to see a bit of kind of repetition of history here because way back you know, when the Hebrews were wandering through the wilderness and they were grumbling against God, people are grumbling against Jesus here. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, <laughs> whose father and mother we do? How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? There's a mocking tone. They're like, we know this guy. Come down from heaven, bread of life. Are you joking? We know Joseph. We know Mary. We know when this guy was running around in diapers. 
maybe cloth diapers 2,000 years ago. But you know, the idea is they know him, right? They're trying to cut him down to size. Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Not only is that an indication that his father has sent him, but he's saying, no, Joseph wasn't my actual father. My father is my father in heaven. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. And he quotes their own scriptures, Isaiah 54, verse 13, as a way of saying, you have some learning to do. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers, meaning your spiritual forefathers, ancestors, ate manna in the wilderness, and they did. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. (laughs) I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. Pause. We're getting weird. <laughs> Like when you read this, like, whoa, that sounds weird. What are you talking about? So I just want to pause for a second here. I'm actually in this verse, historically, this is of interest that uh, historically people who weren't like within the Christian movement, but even in the first and second centuries, looked inside Christianity and criticized them of some things. One of them was cannibalism. And it was because of passages just like this, right? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. That's what it sounds like unless you know what he's talking about. And so that's something we need to keep in mind. Um, uh, Another thing that actually they were uh, sometimes criticized of was incest. Um, Now, why would that be? Because at the time, just like now, there was a a very wide permissive sexual culture in the the Greco-Roman world in the first century. So some people think that's new today. It's not new. It's, It's old. It's always been the case. Christianity comes along. There's a very specific high and holy sexual ethic, which is very specific. Um, However, what people didn't realize is that they saw these Christian families, these husbands and wives, and they were calling each other brother and sister. And so what are you talking, these these, these people are in this intimate relationship and they're calling one another brother and sister. And so if they didn't realize that, oh, Christians call each other brother and sister as siblings in the family of Christ, they wouldn't know what was really going on. So uh, this is some of the ways that from the outside Christianity was um, uh, criticized for. But we need to realize that Jesus is clearly speaking very metaphorically. Very metaphorically, right? So it traces back to belief, to feast on Jesus. And it's really emphatic. Like this uh, standard Greek word for eat says, gnaws on, chews on my flesh. Like this is, these are really visceral terms. But really he's meaning like deep internal ingestion, really deeply internally adjusting and feeding on the love and truth and presence of Christ. That's what he's tracing, uh, that's what he's saying. And it traces back to what he says about believing in him back in verse 35. Let's continue verse 57. As the living Father sent me, I and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum, right, as we've said. When many of his disciples heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? Yeah, no kidding, meaning hard to accept. They're like, wow, this is... This is heavy stuff. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? So you get the sense here that like, this is most likely a reference to after his resurrection when he ascends to be at his heavenly Father's right hand. He's like, you think this is something? You wait till you see that. It's like a kid's gone to Canada's Wonderland for the first time. He's running on the bumper cars. Like, wait till you see Leviathan. Like, it's like, in comparison, look, wait till you see something else. So Jesus is preparing them for seeing and hearing even greater things. Verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life, Holy Spirit. The flesh is no help at all. Flesh is to our broken, sinful nature. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who were and 
sorry, those who were and who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by, my fa- by the Father. So Jesus is here indicating is that when people come to him, meaning believe in him, truly believe and genuinely believe to him, come to him in faith, it is on the Father's initiative. So no one comes to someone in faith unless God has taken the first move and unless God has made that initiative. This is a bit of a crude analogy, but uh, as you know, um, a little while ago we went to South Carolina for a wedding. And you go up to the border, am I the only one that kind of gets a little bit nervous when you drive up to the border? <laughs> like, I haven't done anything wrong and I'm still kind of nervous. Anyway, you go up there, you don't go through until the gate is opened, <laughs> right? right? It's like they have to make that decision. The gate opens, then you go through. That's, to me, that's kind of like someone coming to faith. The Lord opens the door and you respond uh, in faith. It's kind of how Jesus is, is saying the initiative is with God. After this, verse 66, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. That isn't a reference to the 12 apostles. That's to the wider group of disciples. They left. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. (laughs) How true. That is so great. That just reaches through the past into the ages. Where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life then, now, always. So wonderful. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Um, it, to me, part of the reason, the reason uh, John, the apostle, who is the gospel writer, includes this detail is, you know, genuine belief matters. Um, people can go through the motions. There are a lot of people who are near to holy things, but who don't necessarily genuinely believe. The Lord knows the heart, right? Judas was there. He was with the 12. He was walking with Jesus, and he still betrayed him. Proximity to holy things does not necessarily equal um, uh, righteousness. So we're going to end the text there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, I want to return to that thesis statement that I said previously. Your soul has an appetite. Fill it with the wrong thing, and it will be eternally corroded. But fill it with the right thing, and it will be eternally corroded. Contented. Now, a soul is, is not really a concept that the water culture talks about a lot, but I think there is kind of a, still it comes up in shows, movies, people wonder what's the deal with the soul, there might be different theories about it. Um, I heard a couple years ago a woman who was desperate for money, and so she actually uh, put up her uh, soul to sell it on eBay for $2,000. She wanted to literally sell her soul on eBay for $2,000. Um, someone alerted eBay to this, and eBay now has a no soul selling policy. Interesting. It's funny that you actually have to make that policy on eBay. Uh, also, uh, curiosity within the medical community, in the 1900s, early 1900s, there was this doctor who really wanted to find out if the soul weighed anything. Okay, if this is the, the soul, may, maybe it has a weight. And so he, he was a medical doctor, and so he got these people permission who were at the point of death, and he was really being very careful about weighing their bodies and, and monitoring liquids intake and everything. And, and he determined that, that everyone, a couple, couple moments after death, got about 21 grams lighter. And so he concluded that a soul must be 21 grams. Now, I'm not going to get into the veracity of that kind of experiment or, or what that has to say, but there is this interest. But the idea that we have a soul is from the Bible. This is this deep, internal, essential, real part of us, which exists on a deeper level beyond our physical existence. And so the idea is that we, our souls have this appetite. There are these cravings that we have, and we need to satisfy them with the things that God wants us to satisfy with them, or we're going to go off the rails, That's what I mean when I say fill it with the wrong thing and it will be eternally corroded. Fill it with the right thing, it will be eternally contented. So I'd like to give you an example of uh, some of the wrong things. We're going to put four things up there. Uh, One is feel good pleasures, experiences, escapes. Now, there are sometimes things that we do, experiences, escapes, things that are good, and that's great. However, if we focus our life on, if if the purpose of our life, if the way that we are fundamentally nourishing ourselves is these mountaintop peak experiences that just feel good, yay, 
we're fundamentally missing something. It's a kind of idolatry because instead of Jesus at the bread of the life being what nourishes us and sustains us right at the center, are these other kind of fleeting experiential things, then we're missing the mark, okay? It's going to leave us corroded. The second thing is relationships. Now, that might be a strange thing to put on here. Aren't relationships good? Yes, they're good. Um, relationships can be very good. We want them to be healthy, loving, and true, and respectful. Absolutely, all those things. Um, however, what some people do is they, they put on another person that they love or care about too much weight, and it's more weight and focus than that person is meant to bear. Some people, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a whatever, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. It's like that person starts to function as a savior in their life. They put so much focus on them that all of a sudden it kind of, it, it kind of, it kind of sets this kind of the relationships and their priorities kind of out of whack and actually can distract them from being actually nourished by God himself. A former professor, retired pastor, uh, Stephen Ferris, told me a story one time that happened to him when he was a boy that really taught him uh, this, and he was getting tucked in from his, uh, by his mom at night, and uh, he, he said, Mommy, do you love me more than anybody? in the world? Uh, and she said, no. He's like, what? <laughs> I love God first, I love your dad second, and I love you kids third, all the same. And I was like, oh. Uh, <laughs> he's like, that, that was a lifelong lesson that he needed to learn, that wait a second, it's not all about me. And there's actually an order to relationships, which is actually for the good health and well-being of those relationships. Third, dark power. Now, what I'm about to say might be new or, or strange to some people. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about some of this stuff. Maybe you haven't. Um, there, there is power in God, and the ultimate power is good, godly power under the sovereignty of Jesus. Okay? There is dark power in the world, okay? um, what we call demonic power. And what happens is we live in a time where, now this is, that's, that's, that's a subservient power. It's lower. It's not as strong as the power of God revealed in and through Christ. But dark power is a real thing. Um, and uh, we live in a time, and the reason I say this is because we live in this time where people are like, they kind of go, and, they, and some, not everyone, some people, they, they kind of think about their spirituality. They take these different pieces from here and there, or kind of, you know, the occult, new age, this, and they kind of mix everything up as if they're choosing stuff from a McDonald's billboard. And they're kind of, they think, oh, that kind of works for me, and I kind of, they kind of create this synth synthesis of, of these different kind of things under their plate. Don't do that. I'm going to specifically mention the occult, things like... Ouija boards, things like mediums, things like fortune tellers. We do these things and we open doors, possibly, to demonic presence in our lives. We actually, those are kind of gateways to real demonic presence in our lives. And so we need to be thinking, wait a second, why does scripture teach against these things? Well, <laughs> it's actually because dark power is a thing. Demons are real. There is actually a battle between light and darkness, between good and evil. And so we need to be under the authority of Christ and not do things which could be gateways, possibly bringing some sort of harm or hurt into our lives or our households. And some people think, oh, this is fine. It's not fine. Number four, religion. Uh, now, I've put, this might be a strange thing on there. Isn't that good? I put it in quotes because some people, um, th this is about going through the motions, about it being a ritual. And uh, that kind of obscures the relationship. And some people will stand up, sit down at the right time, go to church at least 80% of Sundays, give to the right causes, say this and that. Yeah, th th those kind of things are good things, but not if they obscure the relationship. And so some people can get so wrapped up in the ritual of everything that they're missing the relationship that we are intended to have through these things. Those things facilitate the relationship. So all of a sudden, one day, we realize on our deathbed, wait a second, I don't even know the God I'm about to meet because I've been focused on the wrong things. Now, there's something called impact bias. With those four things in mind, feel good, pleasures, experiences, escapes, relationships, wrongly placed, dark power for quote-unquote religion, meaning ritualistic religion. There's something called impact bias. With those things in mind, it connects to how our appetites work. And so when you feed an appetite, psychologically what happens is all of a sudden you focus more on that sort of thing and you want to kind of feed that appetite and that craving with more of those sorts of things because you've already stimulated those appetites. 
And so if you're kind of focusing on the wrong thing, you're going to want more and more of those things. But conversely, if you start to satisfy those spiritual deep cravings and appetites with the things of God, you're going to want those more and more. John Piper in his book, A Hunger for God, says this, we are less sensitive to spiritual appetites when we are in bondage to physical ones. And so I just want to encourage you to think about the types of ways that you are satisfying those deep soul cravings that you have. Are you satisfying them with good things or bad things? Jesus in John 6, 35 says this, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And we know the things that help us cultivate that relationship. And that closeness and that feasting, it's prayer, it's scripture reading, it's fellowship with other Christians, it's study, it's servanthood and volunteering, it's, 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 it's godly meditation, it's, it's rest, it's corporate worship. These are all the things that God's people have done for thousands of years. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. How are you satisfying your deep spiritual appetites, really? Be honest. A man at 4 o'clock in the afternoon goes into a fast food restaurant. It's a bit early for dinner, but he goes in anyway. And so he walks up to the menu. He's got about $25 in his pocket, and he kind of chooses his favorite meal, and he supersizes it. And he gets the big Coke, and he goes back, and he just feeds himself at his table, really enjoys it. Anyway, and he wants to get a second Coke. It's a free refill, so he does that. And then he goes up and he gets a vanilla cone, because why not? Goes out into the parking lot, and he looks over there, and he sees a hot dog vendor, and there's no really kind of green safety seal from the health inspector. But he decides to go over anyway. Hey, who wants some street meat? I do. A few extra dollars in his pocket. So he gets that, and he feeds. And as soon as he finishes eating, he sees a great friend of his from Nova Scotia that he hasn't seen in a long time. They're high school buddies, and they used to play rugby together. And so he said, hey, you should come over. I, my, my mom is hosting this meal. You should come over for a visit on the weekend. Wouldn't that be great? He's like, yeah, let's go. And so he goes across the parking lot into his Honda, drives over to his friend's house. They go in the front door. Wow, this is an incredible feast. There's, there's steak. There's a big bowl of mashed potatoes, those good mashed potatoes like his grandmother used to make them with the cheese mixed in. There's a whole bunch of other sides, and there's, and there's teas, and, and, and there's juices, and there's wine, and there's candlelight. And on the side bureau, there's like 10 different desserts. He's like, wow. He said, hey, let's sit down. He said, wait a second. I can't. I'm so, I'm so full. In fact, he can't even sit in the side room beside it, listening to the conversation and enjoying that. Why? Because his stomach is starting to grumbling, and he needs to go lie down in the next room. John Ortberg says that your soul is like the king on a chessboard. The king on a chessboard, when you first look at it, seems like the most limited piece because it can only move one game at a time. But if you lose the king, it's game over. If you lose your soul, it's game over. Amen.